Today on Blue 58, the Packers beat the Kansas City Chiefs on Sunday night football. They actually went out and did it. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink, and I am happy to be with you here for another episode because the Packers won. Hypothetical questions here. Rhetorical questions. Do people arrive Do teams turn the corner? Sooner or later, something like that actually happens. You go from the thing that you're trying, the the thing that you aren't quite yet, to the thing that you are trying to be. And when you phrase it in that kind of language, it sounds like a thing that is going to happen at a certain time. And usually I would say that's something that happens more gradually. But then you see a game like this. We talked about narratives in our preview episode. Here's one. The Packers are here. They're exciting, and they are ready to build on what they are right now. They are building, but they're also something. They have built something, and that something is here right now. Jordan Love is playing like a guy who you want to build around, who you thought he could be when you drafted him back in 2020. The young players are stepping up alongside him. The offensive line is making it so he can do his job, And in a situation like this, they're moving a defense that can be moved on the ground. The defense is doing enough to keep the Packers in games. And tonight, when they needed it, they kept the Chiefs out of the end zone as the Chiefs were trying to claw their way back into this game. The Packers aren't just building. They have built something. And that something is now a 6-6 six and six football team. Returning back to those narratives, Jordan Love, a version of Jordan Love, the product is here. We've talked about Jordan Love, the prospect. Jordan Love, the product, finished, still in progress, whatever, is here. The Packers, how do they do against a good team? Well, they handled a really good team tonight. Offense, defense, and special teams, everybody did their jobs. They put together a good performance against an admittedly pretty injured by the time the game wound down Chiefs team that is still pretty good. How does Matt LaFleur stand up against an elite coach in Andy Reid? Well, Reid couldn't overcome his receivers tonight and couldn't find a way to really take advantage of the the ground game that was exploiting the Packers again and again and again. Matt LaFleur, however, seemed to get just about everybody involved. Everybody had a role on offense, whether it was Christian Watson doing a little bit of everything until he got hurt, unfortunately. Well, there was Jaden Reed catching a lot of really short passes. Well, not a lot, four of them. Uh, the the offensive line continuing their timeshare up front. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. Jordan Love getting put in positions to do what he does really well. Matt LaFleur wins that matchup from a narrative perspective. And then the Taylor Swift narrative. She was present at the game, so that one pays off too. All the stories were there. The Packers came out the hero in all of them because they did what they're, you're supposed to do when the opposing team's most notable fan comes to your game. They spoiled the game for that person. Taylor Swift comes all the way to Green Bay, Wisconsin. We're going to make sure she leaves having had a bad time, at least in terms of watching her football team try to do what she wants them to do. All of these stories were there, and the Packers came out on top in every single one. The best part, I think, about this is if you zoom out, continue to zoom out on the narrative type stuff, it's all changed over the course of the season because everything that was true about this team in, say, late September seems like it's the very opposite now. Back then, Jordan Love, tentative, uncertain, not really clear what he wants to be, what he wants to do as a quarterback, not anymore. In the pocket, he has presence and poise, he's decisive, he's accurate. Even when he's doing bad things, he's doing them well, making his misses uncatchable for the defense, taking sacks in such a way that it still sets up Anders Carlson for a game-sealing field goal. Love is playing really, really well. The receivers, they're young and inconsistent. Well, tonight they were young, sure, but not so inconsistent. They were doing everything that was asked of them and more from the top of the depth chart to the bottom. Christian Watson making plays, Romeo Dobbs making plays, Dontavian Wicks making plays, Malik Heath making plays, Tucker Craft a force in the passing game as well. It's all there. All the young guys were coming together 
in a big way. The only guy who didn't contribute, really, was Luke Musgrave, and he couldn't because his kidney is beat to heck. The defense, a question mark earlier in the season. Well, they held the Chiefs to 19 points tonight, three sacks in the red zone. Sure, Isaiah Pacheco ran around a whole bunch. But what ultimately did the Chiefs get out of that? In a way, they might have run themselves out of the game just with how long all of their drives ended up taking because you're running the clock a whole bunch when you're running the ball as successfully as the Chiefs were. The Chiefs might have just needed more possessions in this one and playing the game the way that they did ensured that they wouldn't have all that many. Reeling back the clock a few months, or well, maybe not a few months, but a few weeks, Matt LaFleur, a big and I think fair question mark. But today, he looks like the guy who had the Packers 13-3, and 13-3, and 13-4 and and in his first three seasons in Green Bay. He seems to have an answer for everything right now, scheming up effective offenses against the Lions, against the Chiefs, and just putting his guys in a position to do what they do well. I can't speak to this to the the level of authority that I would like to be able to, but it seems like the Packers have simplified things a lot on offense while also really ramping up the kind of window dressing that they want to add on a particular play. So all that, like that to say the, the concepts, the things that they're doing don't seem all that complicated, but they're dressing it up in a way that makes it so that even their most simple plays function at a higher level. That's that classic Lafleur phrase, the uh, illusion of complexity there, functioning at its, its best possible level at this point. It was a great performance, and I think the bottom line of this one is how they won. How they won is important because of what it shows about this team. The Packers go into halftime up 14-6, to six, having bled out the clock at the end there, so the Kansas City Chiefs really couldn't get a final shot or, or really any shot at all to double dip, having possessions on either side of the halftime break. Thanks in part to a great punt to end the half by Daniel Whelan, pinning the Chiefs way down deep in their own half after the Packers' last possession really ended up going nowhere. So the Chiefs open the second half down 14-6. to The Packers get the Chiefs to 3rd-18 and on that first drive, but Patrick Mahomes converts on a great play. And that feels pretty bad because the Chiefs go down and score from there, drawing it to 14-12 to with a momentous two-point conversion coming up. It feels like the game is in the balance kind of at this point because the Chiefs had a chance to rally. The Packers got them into a really favorable down and distance, 3rd-18, and about as good as it gets for an opposing defense. But then Patrick Mahomes, the two-time MVP, the defending Super Bowl MVP, the two-time Super Bowl champ, makes a big play, and he makes a big play by finding Travis Kelsey running free in the Packers secondary. It kind of feels like it's starting to unravel a little bit, and they go down and score the touchdown, have to go to, for two to tie, and then the Packers stop the two-point conversion. And then they answer on the ensuing possession. Seven-play drive for a touchdown, including the fourth-and-one moonshot to Romeo Dobbs. Christian Watson scoring a touchdown. It's 21-12. to Chiefs answer, go up 21-19. to Packers get in their own way. They have to punt, but the Chiefs get the ball back early, and the Packers' defense forces a three-and-out. Again, big boy drive time. What do the Packers do? They go down Get three points, go up 24 to 19. It's now you need more than a field goal to get back ahead of the Packers. How do the Packers respond again? Keyshawn Nixon makes a play, makes the play perhaps of the game, one of the best defensive plays of the year to get the ball back for the Packers. And then the Packers put the game away for all but the Chiefs' final drive, which with what I think is the drive of the year to this point. They took over with 5 minutes and 11 seconds left. They managed to put together a 10-play drive that ends with Jordan Love taking a sack, but how he takes it is important. He stays centered on the field, doesn't run the risk of you know, um, throwing up either an interception or an incomplete pass to stop the clock, just goes down, keeps the clock rolling, and Anders Carlson converts what I would describe as a very difficult, easy kick to make it a 27-17 or 27-19 game for the Packers. Then it's all over but the funky last drive, and the Packers come out of there with a win. I go through all those details because it really shows a bunch of complimentary football. We talked about this, I think, at length 
early in the season how the Packers really lacked complementary football in any meaningful aspect of the game. The Falcons game is a perfect example. They end up in a situation where Anders Carlson can kick a long field goal, but penalties push him back. Then late in the game, the Packers cannot get a first down to save their life on offense. The defense just is getting hammered again and again and again, and the Packers offense can bail them out with any time at all to stay on the sideline, rest and recover. And the Falcons end up coming all the way back from being down 12 to win that game 25-24. to It's just a bunch of individualized things happening. All the things are going poorly, and the Packers end up losing. That is not the case tonight. The Packers played well on offense, they played well on defense, special teams did their job, and when you get everybody on the same page like that, you come out with a win. Let's talk about the good things. Jordan Love has to headline things here. When you do things matters. I read an article, I think it was in ESPN magazine, It's it's got to be close to 20 years ago now. It was about this defensive back and I forget even who his name was, but he was lamenting the fact that he never got any sort of national attention. He put up his stats. They were identical to a a St. Louis Rams player named Aeneas Williams. He showed how his stats were identical. He showed that the guys that he covered were as good or better than the guy that Aeneas Williams covered on a weekly basis. But he pointed out that in the season in question, Williams had a couple interceptions on Monday Night Football, had another big game playing on Sunday Night Football, and suddenly he's a Pro Bowl player, and the national media audience sees him because he's playing on primetime football, and suddenly this guy's an all-pro, the guy the article is about, doesn't get any recognition at all. That kind of stuff comes to mind in games like this. Jordan Love didn't just play well, he played his probably most important game of the season on prime time, because those narratives do matter. When people, the national audience, and I know we're more connected as a, as a football consuming fan base than ever before. People have more information than ever before, but the casual fans that show up just to watch what's on their TV and form opinions based on that got to see Jordan Love putting up a great game against Patrick Mahomes. Was it his best game of the year? Was it his best game ever? We can quibble about that. But he did put up a great performance against Patrick Mahomes. And it's important to frame it that way, even though I hate framing it that way on this podcast because we we spent a long time on this show defending Aaron Rodgers for years and years and years. When he plays well, in a playoff game, in a primetime game, but gets let down by other aspects of the Packers team. He ends up losing. And what is the media conversation? Why is Aaron Rodgers choking again? Why can't Aaron Rodgers do this, that, or the other thing? For whatever reason, Rodgers was just the kind of guy who was never going to get the benefit of the doubt there. Aaron Rodgers was a failure in situations like this. When you talk about guys like Tom Brady or sometimes Patrick Mahomes, the narrative always comes out that, well, it's their teammates letting them down. In our Discord server, I always like to say that Aaron Rodgers can fail, but Tom Brady could only be failed by others. That is the sort of conversation that gets fueled in a game like this. uh, Where Aaron Rodgers might play well, but the Packers lose. Jordan Love played well tonight, and the Packers won. And he should get anointed for benefiting from the same thing that got Aaron Rodgers' criticism over the years. He played well tonight. He's been building on the things that he has done poorly all season long. And if it looks like this from here on out, we are golden. Just a small if there, of course. But if it looks like this, everything to this point has paid off. And that is the thing that we have said all along on Jordan Love. It is, it's, it is a narrow road to success, drafting a quarterback. It is a high bar for success in the NFL. And we should, as as fans and people covering the game, should have a high bar for Jordan Love or anybody that you're trying to install as a long-term starter at the most important position of the game. That makes it a very narrow window, a very narrow road to walk to get to success if you're, if you're Jordan Love, if you're Brian Gutekunst, if you're the Green Bay Packers. But if you can walk it, everything else becomes worth it. The conflict with Aaron Rodgers, the contract extension with Aaron Rodgers, the subsequent trade that sent Aaron Rodgers out of town. All of that while Jordan Love is waiting in the background, if it pays off and Jordan Love becomes the next great Packers quarterback, or even a, a, a player who is capable at playing, uh, you know, of playing at a great level 
for a season or two or three, cranking open a Super Bowl window in there, everything else is worth it. If you hit the quarterback pick, everything else works out. That's how important something like this is. If you can show that you can do that on the biggest stages in the NFL, things are going to go well for you. It's not just some random Sunday afternoon against a divisional opponent in a game that nobody's going to see or remember. It's a primetime game, and those things do matter out there. In the grand scheme of your evaluation, when the Packers look at him, when the Packers look at what he what he can do and, and think about things like a contract extension and stuff like that, sure, they're going to weigh the totality of the picture. But when you talk about overall, you know, the steps that he's taken, things like this do matter. Doing it on a stage like this does matter, and he did it in a big way tonight. Second really good thing tonight, A.J. Dillon and the Packers' offensive line. In the preview, we talked about how if there's one vulnerability to this overall pretty good to very good Chiefs defense, it is their run game, one of the worst run defenses in the entire league. Well, the Packers made them pay on the ground. Offensive line for the Packers has not been a a terribly successful run-blocking offensive line this season, but they were solid tonight. Josh Myers moving all over the place tonight. If there's anything that you can praise Josh Myers for, it's his willingness and I guess his ability to at least get in a position to do some pretty crazy stuff. He was pulling left, right, and well, up the center. You can't really pull up the center, but I think you take my meaning there. He's just all over the place, just moving for the Packers offensive line. If anything else, it, it looks like you're doing something. I, I know John Wooden said, don't mistake activity for achievement, but Myers is at least moving. They will pull him out left, right, do whatever for him. And the entire Packers offensive line was carving lanes for A.J. Dillon tonight. Dillon has his second highest output of the season with 73 yards tonight. He looks like the guy that he was supposed to be, even if he only ended up averaging 4.1 yards per carry, never really re- uh, ripped off like a huge run or anything like that. Every carry he had looks like it hurt the defense physically and just in terms of you know the scheme, moving things down the field, whatever. He was doing damage on the ground. Finally, the red zone defense can't ask for much more. Bend, but don't don't break and get the win. The Packers did that. Three sacks in the red zone. That'll get it done. And they got it done tonight. I don't have any really bad things to talk about in this game. One, Just one thing comes to mind, and I don't want to dwell it on, on it too long because it, it's a real bummer. But Christian, Watson in, Christian Watson's injury is just such a shame because he has really started to put some things together circling back to the preview again, he and Romeo Dobbs have been putting together one of their best combined stretches of the year. Both of them, I felt, were were pretty strong again tonight. But Watson's injury stuff pops up again in the very, very worst-looking way. I don't want to play television doctor, but it looked like the the hamstring injury there was, was significant. And it would be a surprise, I think, at this point if he plays next week. And the timing just just makes it extra bad. In addition to, he doesn't want to be hurt, obviously. In addition to just derailing what I think was a strong stretch for him, it just, it really hurts the Packers because things were really building together for this wide receiver group. And other than Jaden Reed, nobody has really showed any kind of, you know, consistent big play ability for this Packers offense down the field in the way that Christian Watson can. So, unfortunately, the timing is just real bad, and and just the injury stuff coming up for Watson again ends up being really bad. But that is just a small asterisk in what should be overall remembered as a very, very good night for the Green Bay Packers. And and that's where we end up landing on what this means and what comes next for the Packers. Because what it means for right now is that everything, even more so, is there for the Packers. We talked about everything being in front of them after their last win. Well, even more so is that true now. Technically, the Packers, I think, are in the playoffs at this point. To get to 9-8, and eight, that figure we, we've said that they need to get to to feel good about at least having a shot at the playoff spot, the Packers just have to be 3-2 and two the rest of the way to get to 9-8, and eight, hitting, sitting at 6-6, six and six, just one game over, the fi- over 500 the rest of the way gets you in the mix for that 7th, maybe 6th seed. Who knows what could, what could end up happening here. And then you get in the playoffs, and who knows what can happen. They're also 500 for the first time since September 28th. 
which is ultimately meaningless when you have this last five week stretch of the season to go, but it, it just feels kind of nice to be above, well, not above water, but at least back to par, put it that way. But beyond that, I think this game and really the, the games that have come before this show that the process is working. It's a lot easier to look smart when you have a good process, of course, but the, the plan that the Packers have had for this season has basically started to work maybe not even started to work. It's just working through 12 games. They're six and six. They're, they've got a shot at the playoffs. Jordan loves improving. The young guys are improving. The defense is doing enough. That sounds pretty good to me. I don't know if we can say that any outcome for this Packers team would really have been a surprise for this year. In my predictions column, I predicted that they would get to 10 wins and, and make the playoffs this year. I haven't talked about that prediction a whole lot because it was looking pretty bad there for a while. But anything, it seemed like, was possible for this Packers team heading into the year. And if you told me back in late August, before they'd even played a game, that at week 13, the Packers would be sitting there with everything still being a possibility for them, that would feel pretty good. And let's be clear, like things could still go badly for this Packers team in terms of record, but I think if nothing else, we're going to come out of this season with with a pretty good feeling about what's possible for this team. I mean, maybe they don't end up making the playoffs. Maybe they fall into a bit of a tailspin over the next month or so and, and just end up not being able to, to complete what they started building. But for the last month... W- But for the last month, we've got a really encouraging glimpse at what's possible for this Packers team. And that feels pretty good because what has what they've shown to be possible looks pretty darn good. So when the Packers head into next weekend, taking the weekend off, really, playing Monday Night Football against the New York Giants, I think that's what they should be thinking about. Everything is in front of them and anything is possible good and bad. As Matt LaFleur has said, each of the last few weeks, this league can humble you in a hurry. The Packers feel pretty good now. How good do you feel if three weeks from now, they're back to six and nine and saying, well, maybe the playoffs aren't so possible for us anymore. And we've been playing really bad now for three weeks. It's possible the way the Packers have played, it doesn't feel likely anymore. Let's talk about the rookies. I think Lucas Van Ness had his best game in a while, at least statistically, a sack, two quarterbacks hit. His, uh, his first sack since week one, by the way. Two quarterback hits, one tackle for loss. Pretty solid outing, I think, for Lucas Van Ness. His sack comes on a play where he's rush- rushing with his hand on the ground. I wonder if the Packers have just said, do what's comfortable for you at this point, or try to put him in a position where he can do what's comfortable while trying to mix in some of the more stand-up edge stuff that I think they're going to want him to do long term. It's working. It feels like he's been playing better the last two or three weeks. Luke Musgrave still hurt, of course. Best wishes to him as he continues to recover. Jaden Reed, I felt, was minimized today, and there may be some injury aspects you know, playing out there. He's been hurt for a while now, but four catches for 16 yards. At least they made an effort to get him involved before it became apparent that he was not going to be a central focus of the offense today. Tucker Kraft, three catches for 37 yards. It finally feels like he's got his feet underneath him. He's still a rookie, but he's not a lost rookie. He knows where everything is. He knows that he can get away with a little bit more as a pro. It feels like he is a a valuable contributor to this Packers offense. And some tantalizing possibilities with him and Luke Musgrave really starting to hit their stride if they get together on the field yet this season or at the very least next year. The Packers may have something in their tight end room, the likes of which we hadn't haven't seen in a long time. Colby Wood, no stats today. Sean Clifford, a DNP. Good job, Sean. That's exactly where we want you. Dontavian Wicks, three catches, 43 yards. Between him and Malik Heath, man, just beautiful football players to watch. Big, rugged, strong with the ball. I remember back in the preseason, we talked about them looking like they belonged on the field. I think that is still true. It took some time, especially for Malik Heath, to really make it look like it did in the preseason. But now it's clicking for both of them. They just look good on the field, and they look strong 
in ways that the Packers' other receivers, you know, don't necessarily look all the time. I think it's fair to say whatever your opinion on Watson or Romeo Dobbs or or Jaden Reed, well, for sure Watson and Dobbs are more finesse players. Dontavian Wicks isn't. Malik Heath isn't. They're big, strong guys that are going to run into and bounce off of you, hopefully most of the time. And Jaden Reed will try the same thing, considerably smaller than both of those guys, though. Uh, but powerful players, both Wicks and Heath, and you got to see a look at that for both of them at times tonight. Carl Brooks, two assist tackles, nothing super notable from him tonight, I thought. Can't have a stat sheet stuffing performance every week, though, especially not as a rookie defensive lineman. Anders Carlson, if you were wondering how he would handle adversity, let his last kick tonight answer the question for you. How about drilling the toughest easy kick you really can imagine? 48 yards in the swirling winds of Lambeau Field. I mean, 48 yards isn't easy, but I think most of the time you wouldn't consider that a terribly high degree of difficulty kick. However, you're trying to go from up five to up eight. It's not really a game-winning field goal, but it is kind of a game-winning field goal in some respects. A very important field goal, and nothing, if, if nothing else, and Carlson drills it basically right down the middle. Okay, perhaps slightly off center. The ball is, or the, the point is to put the ball through the uprights. He did that in a high pressure situation. No complaints, no further questions or, or desires there for, for Mr. Carlson. Carrington Valentine, one pass defense today, got away with a defensive pass interference on that last drive. I don't know. Look, That last drive was wildly officiated. You always love having a game end up in just the capricious hands of the the referees, but it just felt like anything could happen on that last drive from an officiating perspective. Calls, no calls, weird stuff one way or another. Kind of the perfect example of why the, the booth refs are kind of a weird phenomenon. You've got and, you know, this is an aside from Carrington Valentine, but let's just talk about that last drive. You've got Jonathan Owens hitting Patrick Mahomes while Mahomes is in bounds and getting flagged for it because I, th- I think the pool reporter said that, or the, the ref said to the pool reporter that it looked like excessive force, essentially. Well, I didn't know there was an excessive force penalty in the NFL. There's unnecessary roughness, but Patrick Mahomes was running for a first down. Jonathan Owens' job is to try to stop him. He did. He stopped him really, really hard. That's not a penalty, and it shouldn't be. But then later on the drive, well, and then weighing in from the booth is the rules official who says, like, yeah, absolutely, that's the wrong call. Well, you're undermining the stuff on the field even more than it is already. We don't need to, like, make that an official statement from the broadcast that this was a bad call. Then you've got Carrington Valentine committing for all the world what looked like a pretty obvious defensive pass interference call. I mean, I'm always grateful when things don't get called, but if a play like that did get flagged, it's, you kind of just sit there at the couch at home and go, okay, yeah, well, I suppose you got to call that one, but they didn't. And they said it, it didn't appear like he hindered the receiver's progress. Well, I don't know what you're going to do to hinder a receiver's progress more than just grabbing his head, but if you don't want to call it fine, but what do they say in the booth? Yeah, that was an obvious penalty that should have been called. Okay, again, we're undermining decisions on the field. And then on the last play of the game, yeah, it looks bad. It looks like there's a bunch of contact on a Hail Mary, but you know which Hail Mary has a bunch of contact? Literally all of them. And Chris Collins was sitting in the booth basically choking back tears about how there was a defensive pass interference that really looked like there should be a call there. (laughs) Well, it's never going to get called there. And at least the booth guy got that right and managed to sort Chris out there and say, it's just not going to get called. It never is which is an entirely different conversation. Why are certain plays officiated differently than other ones? But man, just a wild last drive highlighted, in fact, or in part, bringing it full circle by Carrington Valentine getting away with one. Anthony Johnson won assist on a tackle today. Didn't see much of him tonight, but it's just the, the view from the couch. Malik Heath, one catch for 15 yards. Great runner after the catch stuff from him tonight. Emmanuel Wilson still out because he's hurt. Bretton Cox was as inactive. And then Ben Sims scores his first career touchdown on a great play tonight. Love to see the tight ends getting involved, especially a rookie tight end, especially a rookie tight end who gets to catch a touchdown for the first time in the NFL. Random thoughts and observations, then we will send you on your merry way off into a week highlighted 
by your Green Bay Packers taking down the defending champs. Uniform matchup tonight. Fantastic stuff. No complaints, no notes on the Packers green over yellow. Home uniforms. The green and gold always looks great in primetime, and it looks especially good when you're going up against the Kansas City Chiefs in what I would consider their best outfit. Their white over white road uniforms. Would love a little bit more red in the socks, maybe, but they've got the beautiful stripes down there. Great stuff. Great uniforms. Great looking football on the field on Sunday Night Football. Saw a lot of Jordan Love going to can calls tonight. Cans are a specific kind of audible, pretty common to the Shanahan tree offense. Basically, you're calling two plays in the huddle. You've got your primary call, and if you get a look that you either like or don't like, you go to the can call. It's basically your backup call for this situation. We've got six of them tonight by my charting, at least on the fly, and things turned out pretty well for Jordan Love going to the can tonight. Boy, that is a weird sentence. We're going to leave that one in. Uh, could edit it out. We're going to not we're going to go ahead and not add that one out. When he goes to the can plays, things turned out pretty good for Jordan Love tonight. Got a three-yard run by A.J. Dillon, a 27-yard catch and run by Dontavion Wicks, both Christian Watson touchdowns. Then you've got a throwaway and a sack on the Packers' last drive. Six can calls, three really big plays, one okay play on the three-yard run, and then two plays that end up not hurting the Packers at all but could be considered, I suppose, negatives in terms of wasting plays, quote-unquote, on a key late drive. Packers did struggle in one area of the game on offense tonight. They went 0-4 for 4 on the night in third and long situations. This is where context matters a little bit. I consider third and long, well, I chart third and longs in my game notes uh, based on what Nathaniel Hackett said while he was the Packers' offensive coordinator. He said anything third and six or under they considered a makeable first down, just running their normal offense. Third and seven or longer, they considered third and long, where they had to go to a bit of a different defensive or a different offensive structure. So I've always tried to pay attention to that since Matt LaFleur is still there, running essentially the same offense as when Hackett was there. So I assume the approach is is basically the same. In those situations, they had four of them tonight. They went 0 for 4, but they were third and really long most of the time. There's a difference even if you look at both you know, third and seven and third and 20 as third and long, you understand that they are very different sorts of plays. The Packers third and longs tonight were eight yards, 10 yards, 15 yards, and 15 yards. Unsurprisingly, they went 0 for 4 when you look at the yardage there. That was really their only struggle tonight. Fortunately, they didn't end up in those situations all too often. We did see the offensive line timeshare tonight. Everybody got some significant playing time. Significant, maybe not so much for for Sean Ryan, but he did get some time tonight. Uh, Yash Nyman and Rasheed Walker continue to swap spots. Uh, John Runyon, I thought if you're looking for negative plays, got ragdolled by Chris Jones pretty significantly, but a lot of people do. That's not really a, a super big mark against John Runyon. Chris Jones does that to a lot of people. Rasheed Walker got a holding call that I think you can explain away by Jordan Love just moving outside the pocket on that one. That just tends to happen in that situation. That's when offensive linemen commit holding because you're in a situation where you're locked up on on an opposing defensive lineman and then the quarterback runs by you. You can't see him moving behind you, though. The defensive lineman can. He tries to move away from you. You've still got a hold on his jersey. Well, that ends up being a holding call because you're going from a situation where grabbing a guy is essentially legal to grabbing a guy in a situation where it's not. And there's nothing that you really know about that because things are happening outside of your field of vision. Just a little bit unlucky. So I suspect we're doing going to just continue to see this for as long as they feel they need to do it and as long as everybody's healthy. Is it a good idea? I don't know. It's working for right now. Let's put it let's put it that way. Finally, a sighting of James Robinson. He is alive, and he is well, and he got his first touch in the NFL in almost exactly the, a year. The last time he handled a football in the National Football League was December 4th, 2022. And as we now record this episode at quarter after one on December 4th, it, it's been exactly a year since we last talked about James Robinson having a meaningful contribution in an NFL game. Well, you can debate the the level of meaning that he had. One carry for two yards, one catch for negative two yards means that he touched the ball twice and actually contributed zero net yards to the Packers offense. But still, he was on the field and he got the ball twice. How about that? Maybe not finally. Let's let's end on this. 
It's always going to bother me comparing Jordan Love to Aaron Rodgers. There are so many variables in their first seasons, and their situations were remarkably different. Heck, even the structure of the league, 16, 15 years apart, is remarkably different. We've had two different CBAs be ratified by the NFL since Aaron Rodgers took over as the Packers starter way back in 2008. However, we can point out this. The 2008 Packers never got to 6-6, and which is where the 2023 Packers are right now. Those Packers back in 2008 started 5-6 and and then lost four in a row. These Packers seem to be gelling. They're 6-6, and and the arrow seems to be pointing up. Who knows what the remainder of the season could hold, but the Packers are doing their very best to make sure that it holds a lot of promise for what this team could be. That's all I've got for you in this episode of Blue 58. I appreciate you tuning in. I would appreciate it even more if you would take a second and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it that's going to help more people find the show and get more people involved in this conversation you and I are having about the Green Bay Packers, which in turn is going to help all of us, me included, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.